that says your brain is not fully developed until the age of 25. And Eric and Lyle were 18 and 21 at the time they killed their parents, which um, I want to mention one little factoid. The, no the number one question people ask me is that they were 18 and 21. Why didn't they just walk out? And in his closing argument in the second trial, prosecutor David Kahn said they didn't have to kill their parents. They could have, you know, walked out the front door, got in the car and drove away. The answer to that question, people ask me, is that the defense therapy experts explained to me that uh, Eric and Lyle Menendez's emotional age was somewhere around 8 to 10 years old. The parents made brothers very dependent on them. They used to do their homework. They used to control every aspect of their lives, tell them who they could be friends with tell them what girls they could go out with. And so the brothers couldn't imagine life without their parents. A normal person, it's easy to say, yeah, I should have just walked out the door and walked away if this was going on in, in my family. The uh, brothers were operating, you know, with a different prism, a different perspective uh, on life. Right. And we person. recall that um, Lyle attended Princeton, so in our minds, we're like, you know, Ivy League University, he must have been extremely intelligent. But a lot of that was based on, I would say, donations. Would, would you agree? Right. Both brothers were nationally ranked tennis players because the father had started training them when they were very young. He would get them up at five in the morning and have them hit balls for three hours before they went to school. Lyle was, was really not academically cut out to uh, be at Princeton. He really didn't have the academic strength to be there, but he was a star tennis player. And Jose Menendez made one $50,000 donation to uh, Princeton, which led to his admission. And then he ended up later making another large donation. But I mean, Princeton. he donated enough money that they did let them have a, a memorial service in the Princeton University Chapel, which just blows my mind. Right. Well, we've had the recent case with uh, UCLA, USC, and Yale, and a number of other schools. Kind of the old-fashioned way people did things where you just got out your checkbook and you wrote a fat check to the school. And uh, miraculously, your kid slid in. Dave Menendez was very controlling. You know, the family lived in Beverly Hills. They lived behind the gates of a, a beautiful mansion. And on the outside, everything was, was perfect. But it was really just a facade. Behind the gates of that mansion, you know, it was a family with secrets, and there were a lot of weird things going on. So right before we went down into quarantine a couple of months ago, you you went out to R.J. Donovan in San Diego, and what did how how did that visit go? Great. Before the uh, pandemic, I used to visit Lyle Menendez every two or three months. The biggest change in, in the brothers, uh, you know, they, they've now been in jail for uh, 30 years. Their arrest was uh, uh, March of 1990. And so it's been 30 years and five months. You know, both brothers were, you know, when I met them, were, were very young and immature. And now they're grown men. And they've actually made something of their lives in state prison. Actually, they were separated had not seen each other for 22 years since the first trial. They were placed in separate prisons. The Beverly Hills police made a motion the day before their sentencing to keep them separated uh, on the theory that they had conspired to commit a crime. And if they were placed in the same facility, they might conspire to commit another crime. And that's that's just silly. I mean, they really, I think they really filed that right. motion just to be mean. So the brothers were reunited in April of 2018. So now they are both at uh, R.J. Donovan Prison near San Diego. It's in Ote Mesa, about a mile from the Mexican border. They're very happy uh, to be together. They, they don't share the same cell, but they're right in the same area of the prison next to each other. And they both uh, actually made something, you know, out of their lives. Uh, Lyle's very involved in prison reform activism. And uh, Eric Menendez has uh, created a hospice program at uh, the prison he's at now and ha also at the previous prison. He leads a weekly group of mindful meditation. And so both brothers are, um, you know, really trying to give back to their prison communities. As I've said before, the streets of California are not safer tonight because Lyle and Eric Menendez are locked up. You know, half the jurors in the first trial voted for manslaughter. If they had been convicted on the manslaughter counts, uh, they would have served 22 years, 11 years for each count. And they would have been out uh, eight years ago. I think it's a time that, uh, you know, this case should be reviewed, and particularly, you know, based on the uh, youth offender laws, which say that, you know, if you were under 25 at the time of your crime, that you can apply to have your case reviewed. But there's an exception to that law, which is if you were sentenced to life without parole, uh, you can't apply for that review. You're not eligible. Both brothers are uh, married. 
Eric Menendez met his wife, who began writing him letters during the first trial. And uh, the letters led to phone calls, and it led to a larger relationship. Soon-to-be uh, wife ended up moving to California to be close to him, and they were married in the late 1990s. And so Eric Menendez has been uh, married for uh, about 20 years. And um, Lyle Menendez was actually married over the phone uh, the night before he was sentenced in, in uh, July of 1996. And I, I was at the wedding uh, in Leslie Abramson's uh, office. He had a friend who he had met through initially through letters and then phone calls. And then a woman moved to Los Angeles from Denver. Leslie Abramson had arranged for Lyle to be married in a courtroom in downtown L.A. on the day before brothers were being sentenced in July of 96. At the last minute, the supervising judge in the L.A. Superior Court system found out that there was an order to transport Lyle from the jail a mile away to the courthouse so he could get married. And the judge stopped the order and did not allow him to be brought to the courthouse. And so Leslie Abramson uh, did some fast thinking with her friend, the judge, uh, Nancy Brown. And under California maritime law, you can be married over the phone. And so um, I was actually invited to Leslie Abramson's office the night before the sentencing. And Lyle Menendez's aunt Terry was there and his uh, fiance Anna. And the judge married them over the phone. And also Eric Menendez called in. Everybody was on a speakerphone. So they were married over the phone. That marriage ended in a divorce about two years later, and Lyle uh, married an attorney in uh, 2003, and they have a very strong uh, relationship. I actually visited Lyle at uh, Mule Creek and got to meet his wife, see them together during one of my visits uh, for about four hours. They have a very loving, affectionate relationship. When you when you visit in California state prisons, uh, most visiting is actually done. You, you sit at little tables across from each other, and you can quick hug coming in and going out. But there there are no uh, conjugal visits for life without parole prisoners. The theory of conjugal visits is that uh, if you're going to be out in a few years, to try to keep your family together. And if you're in for life without parole, I guess they don't really care. The laws were changed because of some members of the Manson family. Tex married someone after he was convicted and had six children through conjugal visits, and the wife and kids were all on welfare. So when the Republicans were in office in, in the, the 1980s, they changed the laws to, if you're in for life without parole, that you can't uh, have conjugal. What about the Dick Wolf program? Tell them about working on that. Sure. In uh, 2016, I was hired by uh, Dick Wolf to um, develop an eight-hour series that aired on NBC in the fall of 2017 called Law and Order, True Crime, The Menendez Murders. And uh, I gave them access to my book, which hadn't been published yet. Uh, My book came out in the fall of 2018, about a year after the series. The best that I was hoping for when they hired me was that uh, they would tell a balanced story, half defense, half prosecution. And about three months into working with them, they called me into an office, showed me an outline, and uh, they had decided to basically take a point of view that was entirely uh, sympathetic and empathetic to the defense and to the brothers. And so um, that was a, a great experience to, you know, see how a, and the, the TV series is uh, streaming on most, on Amazon, you know, most major platforms. I recommend it. Stars Edie Falco with the help of, with the help of a really wig. blonde wig, and you have uh, Heather Graham as Judah Lawn, right? Right, little girl. Have you spoken to them recently? Have you heard anything about how they're doing? I have. I actually talked to uh, Lyle about ten days ago. They are both, you know, surviving the pandemic. They've been very fortunate at Donovan Prison. They they have had very few uh, active cases. There was a terrible yeah. outbreak at San Quentin near San Francisco, and there have been uh, also uh, major outbreaks in a couple of the federal prisons in California. But Donovan Prison has only had two or three cases, and so uh, he told me that people are wearing masks. They're social distancing as best you can in a prison situation, which is very challenging. Everybody needs to be taken care of no matter where you live. So that's good to know. And I just want to end here and just say thank you so much to my dear friend, Robert Rand. So much good work, so much interesting work you've done, Robert. And we just want to say thank you and stay safe out there. You're welcome. Everyone take care.